William Herbert Wallace was born in Millam, Cumberland, in 1878. After school, Wallace worked as a draper's assistant in Lancashire. A few years later, he worked for Messrs. Whiteway Laidlaw & Company. He worked there for over nine years and moved from place to place, before finally resigning in 1907 due to health complications. He obtained a position working for the Liberal Party in Harrogate, rising to the post of election agent in 1911. During his time in Harrogate, he met Julia Dennis. They soon began dating, and got married in March 1914. Wallace found himself out of a job when the First World War broke out, and through his father's help, he obtained a position as collections agent with the Prudential Assurance Company in Liverpool. The Wallaces moved to Liverpool in 1915, settling in the district of Anfield. During the 1920s, Wallace supplemented his comfortable but mundane existence as collections agent by lecturing part-time in chemistry, at Liverpool Technical College. His hobbies included chemistry, botany, and chess, and he learned to play the violin to enable him to accompany Julia, who was an accomplished pianist, in musical evenings, at their home at 29 Wolverton Street, Anfield. Very little is known about Julia, except that she was a meek, mild, old-fashioned kind of woman, who seemed to be well suited to her equally meek and mild husband. From all appearances, their marriage was stable and happy, they never had public scenes, and the walls of the houses on Wolverton Street were thin. And, contrary to the rumors that ran rampant through Liverpool during and after the murder trial, no other man or woman was ever found. The story began on January 19, 1931. It was a Monday night, the regular meeting night for the Liverpool Chess Club. At 7.20 p.m., shortly before Wallace arrived at the club, the club captain took a telephone call from a man identifying himself as R.M. Qualtro, asking for Wallace to call at his house at 25 Menlove Gardens East the following night at 7.30 p.m., concerning an endowment policy for his daughter. Wallace arrived shortly after 7.30 p.m. for his scheduled match at the club. After being given the message, he commented that he knew no one named Qualtro, and had never heard of Menlove Gardens East. Nor had anyone else at the club, although everyone agreed it was most likely off Menlove Avenue somewhere. Wallace was convinced he could find it. On January 20, Wallace got home from work around 6 p.m. Sometime between 6.30 and 6.45 p.m., the milk boy stopped by and collected his money from Julia. This was the last time someone other than William had seen Julia alive. Wallace advised Julia not to allow anyone in their home while he was away, then set off on his journey. He traveled by tram car and arrived at Menlove Avenue, just after 7 p.m. After searching relentlessly for Menlove Gardens East, inquiring at local newspapers, and even asking a police officer, William realized that it did not exist, there was a Menlove Gardens North, South, and West, but no East. Wallace realized that someone had pulled a prank on him, sending him off on a wild goose chase. He gave up after 45 minutes and went home. Wallace arrived at his home around 8.45 p.m., and ran into his neighbors, the Johnstons, who later stated that Wallace had claimed he couldn't enter his home from the front or the back. Wallace apparently asked them if they had heard anything unusual that night, to which they responded no. They also stated that immediately after this, Wallace tried opening the back door, which opened on the first try. As they waited outside, Wallace entered the house and a few moments later, Wallace hurried outside, and said that his wife had been killed. To the Johnston's horror, Julia Wallace was laid out in front of the gas fire in the front room, violently battered to death, blood splatter splashed across the walls. Back in the kitchen, Wallace noticed the locked cupboard where he kept his insurance collection money had been wrenched open, and the four pounds inside had been stolen. If it was a robbery that turned to murder, the house was not ransacked, as would be expected, and nothing else had been taken including the money from Julia's handbag, which rested on the kitchen table. At this point John Johnston took charge, ordering his wife and Wallace to stay in the house and touch nothing while he fetched the police and a doctor, the latter, clearly a futile gesture considering the grisly state of Julia's body in the room next door. The Merseyside police soon arrived at the scene, but their handling of the investigation left much to be desired as a major strike in 1919 had left the force seriously weakened, 
and with a significant number of staff dismissed, those left behind were charged with filling roles they weren't properly qualified for. A journalist from the Liverpool Daily Post was called out to act as the police photographer. His haunting images of the crime scene and Julia's body remain a chilling reminder of the gruesome nature of her murder. A medical professor from Liverpool University called John Edward Whitley McFall was also called out, in place of a professional forensic expert, to determine the cause and time of death. Before intelligent forensics techniques were developed, rigor mortis was used to determine an approximate time of death. Looking at the state of Julia's body, McFall stated she must have died at around 8 p.m. Crucially, this time of death was nearly an hour before Wallace arrived home. Of course, future crime historians would go on to criticize McFall's lack of proper testing. He never considered measuring cadaver temperature, observing postmortem lividity, or analyzing stomach contents, all more accurate ways of determining the time of death. The police discovered little else of value. There was some disorder, as though someone had done some half-hearted searching, and Wallace would claim he was missing a few pounds. Despite an extensive search of the house, the garden, the sewers, and areas adjacent to the tram lines between Wolverton Street and Menlove Avenue, the murder weapon was never found. The police were convinced that it would have been possible for Wallace to murder his wife, and still have time to arrive at the spot where he boarded his tram. They attempted to prove this by having a fit, young detective, go through the motions of the murder, and then sprint all the way to the tram stop, something an ailing 52-year-old Wallace probably could not have accomplished. The original assessment of the time of death, around 8 p.m., was also later changed to just after 6.30 p.m., although there was no additional evidence on which to base the earlier timing. The police also hypothesized that Wallace could have used the Macintosh, or a raincoat, which was found to have been lying under Julia's corpse, to shield himself from all the blood spatter while committing the crime. Examination of the bath and drains revealed that they had not been recently used, and there was no trace of blood there either, apart from a single tiny clot in the toilet pan, the origin of which could not be established. Whoever Qualtro was, and whatever the purpose of the call, it had succeeded in providing Wallace with an almost cast iron alibi. The problem was, it didn't look like anyone else could have committed the crime either. No weapon, no suspects, no witnesses and the body found in a locked house, whoever had killed Julia, appeared to have pulled off the perfect crime. William voluntarily complied with the law and made two statements. He was questioned, then released. But when two weeks passed without any clues, save for the cryptic chess club phone message, police arrested William, and charged him with his wife's murder. They had rounded up enough circumstantial evidence to justify the charge, including proof, that the mysterious phone call had been placed from a telephone box, just 400 yards from the Wallace residence. Despite his persistent claims of innocence, the murder charge stuck, and William stood trial at Liverpool Assizes. Most of the trial leaned in favor of William's acquittal, including testimony from a milk delivery boy who claimed to have met with Julia just minutes before her murder. But, after an hour's deliberation, William was found guilty and sentenced to death. In an unprecedented twist, the conviction was overturned by the Court of Criminal Appeal. The court found that the evidence was unsatisfactory, and William was once again free. In the wake of the trial and the surrounding scandal, William struggled to find normalcy. He received threats and hate mail on a regular basis. And, though he was still employed by the Prudential Assurance Company, many of his customers abandoned him. The press, of course, had a lot of attention-grabbing headlines for the case. Wallace was painted as an occultist, a philander, and most of all, an intellectual, chess-playing mastermind, the chess player they couldn't checkmate, as one newspaper put it. Straight from the pages of fiction, Wallace had impeccably plotted a fiendish murder that both outwitted the police and generations of armchair detectives. But if Wallace really was a criminal genius, he did not have long to savor his victory. Unable to bear the ordeal of his wife's death and the subsequent marring of his name by the media and public, Wallace moved into a quiet bungalow in the Wirral. Suffering a recurrence of his old kidney troubles, he fell ill in December of 1932. In February of 1933, two years after his wife's brutal murder, Wallace died from uremia and pyelonephritis, 
in Clatterbridge Hospital at age 54. If the mild-mannered insurance salesman had any dark secrets, he had taken them to his grave. Since Wallace's death, the case has become one of the most debated in criminal history. Dozens of books have been written advocating various theories, some centered on Wallace's guilt, others on his innocence. The theories that paint Wallace as guilty, usually talk about how his alibi seemed too good to be true. Theorists say that Qualtro and Wallace are the same person, and state that the nature of Julia's murder, shows that a simple burglar would not have the need to go so far as to bludgeon her so violently. They claim that it was a crime of passion, and that Wallace had murdered Julia due to some domestic strife. This theory however, has many flaws, including the fact that Wallace had a solid alibi, and there had been no credible evidence to support any marital troubles that the Wallaces were allegedly facing. Perhaps the most intriguing theory concerns a man named Richard Gordon Perry, a junior employee at the Prudential Assurance Company. At the time of Julia's murder, Perry was 22 years old. He owned a car, and reportedly lived a reckless life. As Williams' co-worker, Perry knew that Williams' daily insurance collections would have been kept in a cash box at home. Perry was also well acquainted with Julia Wallace, and it's feasible that Julia would have allowed him into the house under a random pretext. It has been theorized, that Perry made the phone call to the chess club in order to lure William away the following evening. Once William was out of sight, Perry called on Julia Wallace, gained entry to the house, murdered her, and stole the collection money. In 1980, a news editor named Roger Wilkes, revisited the crime for a radio show. His investigation led him back to Richard Gordon Perry, whom he learned had actually been questioned by police, but was released after presenting a convincing alibi. But Wilkes also discovered evidence that Perry had visited a local garage to wash his car with a high-powered hose, and that a garage attendant noticed one of Perry's blood-soaked gloves. By the time Wilkes had pieced together his case closer, it was too late. Richard Gordon Perry had died a few months prior, on April 14, 1980. The murder of Julia Wallace remains stubbornly unsolved to this day. If you have any information regarding the case, or would like to share your opinions, let us know in the comments below. Thank you for watching and we hope you found our video interesting. Like, comment and subscribe for more fascinating unsolved mysteries.